Breaking news here, lead anchor George Luis Lopez accompanied with Christina Sanchez of Brew and Carlos Mondragon. Thank you guys for joining me. Thank you. Breaking news happened today in the University of Louisville. Uh, it had to do with the basketball program. Apparently, the recruits were having sex with strippers, made parties with by our interviewees today. So we interviewed a mom and the two daughters. And the first question we had was, what were the intentions when keeping detailed records, then releasing the information, and then writing a book on these alleged sexual parties? Well, first off, I called the NCAA, and I tried to tell them my story. And I, I was asking them, what should I do? Who should I go to, and who could I talk to? But they wouldn't give me any assistance. You know, they didn't want to talk. They didn't want to hear about a college basketball team. So I decided to Google a publishing company and write a book. So you contacted me. So you kept all these journals and notes. Did you always know that you were going to come forward and tell your story? No, that, that wasn't the plan. It wasn't that I, I always, like I said, I always kept journals. I always wrote down everything and documented everything that I've done. So. Um, I, I kept the journals just to for my own protection in case anything came out or anything happened or you know someone said that this didn't happen. I had my own protection. You also said you also spoke to the lawyer to see the legal issues with what's happening, and there were no criminal charges. It that occurred in selling sex for money in Kentucky for class A misdemeanor, which means the statute of limitations for prosecuting that is a year and then the bigger potential crime would be promoting prostitution and that would be a class D felony in Kentucky does not have a statute of limitations but our position is if they're going to try to prosecute Ms. Powell then they need to prosecute Mr. McGee as well because Mr. McGee also participated by contacting Ms. Powell paying for the parties and paying for ultimately the, the provision of sex so our position is that if the Commonwealth of Kentucky wants to prosecute someone they need to prosecute a basketball coach and Ms. Powell. So from my understanding, this is college. Stuff like this always happens. Everyone knew about the parties. Supposedly the coach didn't. This is Louisville, an elite basketball program where they need strategies to bring in recruits. As you can see in the next clip, the mothers knew they were having fun, and even the daughters knew what they were, what they were getting into. Into the situation. I've, I've done this since 2010. I dealt with U of L since 2010. My daughters didn't come in the picture, picture until late 2013. So, um, yeah, they knew about it, but it was fun. And the girls that I had doing it, they were the, basically their ages, and the basketball players were their ages. And was it was something you had done for years before 2010. Did you have girls that you worked with before this scandal? I know. No. You said it was fun. It was fun for everybody involved. Like. To the parties and just like being around basketball players and things like that. It sounds um, fun. It sounds fun. It sounds like a turnip. I'm sorry, but it just sounds like a normal party. People make just seem worse. Yeah, I don't. I mean, it is a big deal, you know. Everyone mm -hmm. needs to. Uh, everyone. No, everybody wasn't right, you know. But at the end of the day, it's not as bad as people make it seem. It went a little sideways. Do you guys still talk to any of the basketball players that you had sex with? Did you have sex with more than one? No. But in the end, this is about the money, and that's why we see that she's decided to tell her story now. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's about the book and the money. I would be lying if I said it wasn't, but, you know, it, I think people get the, the wrong perception. It, it's, it's like, bash me because of what I've done, but the big picture is, do you want your child to come to college? and? You know, as a young boy, and then leave as a as a as a grown man with, you know, two girls. You know, it it was just it was what it was. It's just the fact that people are overlooking the bigger picture. Yeah, like I said, everybody played their part in it. But I mean, for God's sake, people are sending their kids to universities, and you're not even caring about the fact that this stuff happens, and no telling what else happens. You know, if they call. Well, that's all we have time for today, folks. Thank you for. Okay, now to weather. In weather news, um, the meeting will be going to Paris sometime soon. We'll be talking about different climate changes. 
And, but the problem is, they're talking about major climate changes that are going to be happening around the world when it comes to benefiting globally, but the problem is they're locking, they're locking in places where, or remote parts of the world, like the Pacific Islands. What we're mainly focusing on for climate changes in the United States, in Europe, and Africa, where it's mainly caused by human production, with manufacturers and companies and factories, where that's what's affecting climate change, and that's what's affecting global warming. But then it goes towards the Pacific, where waters are rising, and that's what's affecting their type of climate change, where they're being over extorted for their Pacific Islands and their exotic lands, real resorts and golf courses that it's not being taken into account that they're being hit the most with this. At a summit in Fiji last week, the last major gathering Pacific Island nation before the, the UN talk in Paris next month, Islanders trashed all their collective pleas to the world to help address the health impacts of climate change, particularly on women, adolescents, and children. You know how here in the United States, mostly children talk about games and toys and things that happen at home? It's like the opposite in the Pacific Islands. They're talking about, well, do you see that village that flowed last week? That's what's happening in the world right now. And if you go into here, it's getting attention from the Pope. Since that comes out very clearly, is that the world has to adapt and the world has to mitigate. And the sooner we do that, the less the chances of some of the worst impacts of climate change being faced in different parts of the world. Climate change is really a challenge in managing risk. And it's not that we're talking about identifying a particular thing that's going to happen in a particular place at a particular time. It's understanding how to be prepared in two critical ways. A one critical way is in decreasing the amount of climate change that occurs. And the other is in finding a way to cope as effectively as we can with the climate changes that can't be avoided. The main thing we learned from the report is that we don't really know enough about adaptation to go out with a big um, steamroller type approach and really deploy an effective system. Um, we really are at the stage now where we should be thinking about being ambitious, but being ambitious in a creative way with baby steps that we learn from that allow us to do a better job the next time and a better job the time after that. Okay, so what they're mainly talking about is that they keep talking about how we need to make some big effects, some big different change, but not actually coming up with ideas to actually solve most of them, which is going to be a problem now because within the next few weeks, if something is going to dealt with the Pacific Islands, they're going to start to flow. Like islands like Sri Lanka, where the highest level on the island of Sri Lanka is about 100 feet um, an elevation. So now we're getting to the point where it's like, well, if something's going to be done immediately, we're going to have a problem. And they say that in major Pacific Island leaders, that if we don't want to make a change the way we are, we need to change our approach. Because they're not giving enough attitude with how they are, because they're very peaceful people, but they're not giving enough attitude with how they want to approach these things, nothing's going to happen. Now to you, Carlos. For me, I'll be discussing today about texting and social media. So on my standpoint about this, I have personal experience. <coughs> I actually got into a motorcycle accident a, a few weeks ago, and the lady, I was on a motorcycle, and she hit me because she was texting and driving. She crossed the red, and then down like my bike, and then so did I. I got burned, I burned my first and second, I broke my first and second metacarpal. I also broke my wrist. I got stitches in my knee. I had a, abrasions everywhere. I got burned in my leg. So, with this, we'll go to the video about why texting can be detrimental in the 21st century society. So I fear that she's not going to know how to communicate when she's, you know, out of college or working. Diane Schaller is like many parents. Her 16-year-old daughter is attached to texting. <laughs> Everything is getting replaced by some sort of electronic device, machines. Not face to face. Exactly. And so, as we can see, that this thing, this problem, it's a growing epidemic throughout the U.S. Not with just uh, adults, it's also with teens and, and minors. We can see this turning into a bigger and bigger issue because people, they're no longer looking ahead. They are looking down. They don't know which way is left or right. Just in my example, this is a this is a prime and classic, you know, 
issue that could happen, not just me, but to everyone. It's an engagement to just the whole, like, the whole general population. Full judgment. Excessive technologies can get in the way of that. They don't learn as well to judge um, the tone of voice, the facial expression. And here we can see the like all the negative effects that can happen through texting. Even not just you know personally, this can also happen in the classroom. We see that with all this technology, that it causes the the writing and rewriting. You know. Of, of uh, history, and every single time we take, you know, a test or something, we always look, you know, at our phones. It's always, you know, like, what's the next update? You know, what's the next Twitter feed or Facebook update? You know, it's all just about what am I gonna do next? In such a fast-paced generation, why? It's not just about, you know, technology. Yes, it's about, you know, you know, we live in this like ungodly technological world where we've done so many like radical improvements. But still, we it seems like the more we do this, the more negative effects is gonna happen to us because not just because because there's accidents or we just it's just basically we stop learning how to think. And I think that's above all is the most detrimental, you know, aspect that can ever happen. And right now, these are actually some warning signs from our next follow-up. One of the big problems is children who text a lot have trouble falling asleep. She says they receive a text in the middle of the night from a friend. That wakes them up, and suddenly they're texting for two hours. But experts agree the answer isn't taking away <coughs> technology. Rather, parents need to set the example and model moderate cell phone use. And they actually, I think, need to specifically say, hey, I really want to spend time with you, and so because I love you, I'm going to turn off all of my devices and focus only on you. Responsibility, it begins at home. If the parents do not, do not monitor what their kids are doing throughout a daily basis as they grow up, especially with technology, because there's so many back doors and different things that you can do, do with it, it's so, it's so malleable that, that we need to, you know, just be careful what we do on it because it can affect so much other people negatively. There's, you know, people just have a hard time focusing on one thing because they're always, you know, on their phone. So it's very important that people, you know, pay attention. They, they, they get their eight hours of sleep that they need because people, according to, according to my source, people have they actually lose sleep, you know, when they lose sleep, then they're not as focused. When they're not as focused, they perform poorly, thus affecting not only that their grades, but it's also making, you know, their parents look bad. And then just to sum it up right now, I have, you know, first-hand experience in this. So I feel like with all this amazing technology, that it was supposed to, you know, set us free. It was supposed to democratize us. But instead, it's given us just Howard Dean's aborted candidacy. It's given us, given us 24 acts to key point, you know? People, they don't, like, where's the writing now? People, they don't write anymore. They, they blog, they text. I love my fail this, I love all that. There's no punctuation, pronunciation. So, it seems to me it's just a bunch of stupid people pseudo-communicating with a bunch of other stupid people in this proto-language that resembles more of what cavemen used to speak rather than the King's English. And with that, I'd like to conclude my segment. And this is The View, and thank you very much. I'm Carlos Mondragon. I'm Christina sanchez Abreu. George Lopez. And we'll see you tomorrow at 6. Thank you.